You're listening to Oh My Health, There Is Hope podcast. When your heart is aching and your world is shaking, don't give up. No, no, don't give up. Hello, and welcome to Oh My Health, There Is Hope, the podcast. I'm your host, Jana Short, and today we're here with a really special guest, Dr. Uma Naidu. Dr. Naidu is a Harvard nutritional psychiatrist, professional chef, and nutrition specialist who wrote the recent national best-selling book, This Is Your Brain on Food. She founded and directs the first hospital-based nutritional psychiatry service in the United States and is the director of nutritional and metabolic psychiatry in Massachusetts General Hospital and director of um, nutritional and lifestyle psychiatry at MGH Academy while serving on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Naidu is regarded as a U.S. pioneer in groundbreaking area of nutritional psychiatry. She is a regular expert resource for media and has appeared in publications including the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, Goop, and more, and has had appearances on the ABC News, on Live with Kelly and Ryan, and today. I am so excited to have you here. I know it's been a while us trying to connect, but I'm so excited it's finally here. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Anna. I've been excited too to connect with you. It's, it's lovely to be here. Well, Dr. Naidu, I see your book in the back. So for those of you watching us on YouTube, like, <laughs> wow, um, congratulations on that. And, and the very first thing we do when we do the show um, is we ask all of our guests to share a story of hope, because my message from all of you amazing experts is to share that story of hope for someone who might be struggling to get to the next beautiful phase of their journey. So do you want to share your story of hope with us today? I'd love to. Um, it's it's an unusual one because it, it may not seem hopeful when you first hear it. But, you know, as I was uh, developing out my clinic and my career in nutritional psychiatry over these many years, I was, um, you know, I was practicing good nutrition and, and trying to walk the walk, so to speak. But I was unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer unexpectedly and while feeling otherwise well. And the message of hope in this is that I was almost placed in a position where I had to lean into the work I was doing in order to help heal myself. And by that, I mean, for the first time in my life, I found myself feeling anxious and worried. You know, as a physician, when you unfortunately know the side effects of chemotherapy you're about to face, it's, it's a little bit frightening. And I realized that the thing that I could do was do exactly what I was sharing with my patients, you know, really up my nutrition game, um, put in the nutrients that could help with calming down my body and my system. And the message of hope is that it's possible to use nutrition as an amazing lifestyle intervention while going through any form of serious medical treatment, because it will work for you. Um, you just need patience and time and belief that, that it is a holistic way to think about it while seeing your doctors for whatever your prescriptions are. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, I inadvertently became the subject or uh, that, that role of patient and doctor flipped on me. And it was a very humbling experience, but I, I think it's probably one of my best messages of hope um, to share with others. I love that story because we don't always see the hope in our situation when we're no. in the midst of it. And then we look back out of it. When we get out of the other side, we look back and you're like, wow, that like that was kind of a great experience. Even though it was painful, I learned so much. So I love that you shared that. I would love to hear about the connection to your brain and food. Like I'm a full firm believer that whatever I'm putting in my body is either fueling me or killing me. Right. And so I want to pay attention to like <laughs> how that works for me. And it took me until I was in my fifties to figure that out. Like what I'm eating is either keeping me thriving and fueling me, or it's dragging me down and killing me <laughs> slowly. So, and, and yeah, and, and I'm sorry, but you're so right about that. In fact, you've hit the nail on the head. I think that if we more of us uh, thought about it in clear, uh, in a clear way, it would be a lot easier. You know, the, the country is always in a state of diet uh, dilemmas and food wars. It's, it's eat this, not that, um, you know, this diet is the best, this time of year, weight loss is the number one thing people are interested in. 
truth is that fuel uh, that that food is fuel for our body, but it's also food food and fuel for our brain. Meaning that the food we eat, because of the gut brain connection, this ecosystem that exists between these two organs, the food we eat becomes really important. Um, so let me let me unpack that for a second. The gut and brain are connected. They come from the exact same cells in the human embryo. They then are connected throughout life by the vagus nerve, which then acts as a two-way chemical messaging system. So signals from the gut and brain communicate up and down, back and forth all the time. So when you think about it, on a day that you're eating that healthier meal, um, maybe the one that you uh, kind of discovered earlier in your, in your 50s, um, what happens is that the breakdown products of that food, the digestion and the digestive products are positive for our body but they're positive for the microbes and for the gut as well. And positive substances get formed like short chain fatty acids. But when you're going through the fast food lane and eating junk foods and processed foods, and that's sort of what your diet consists of, then the bad microbes in the gut are involved. They, they yearn for that type of food. The breakdown products that they form are more toxic to our body. And as you eat more of that, the lining of the gut, which is very delicate in one single cell layer thin, starts to get damaged. And over time, you develop things like leaky gut and gut inflammation. Gut inflammation leads to inflammation in the brain. So when we think about it, you're absolutely right, John. It's, it's you know, you can eat food that will help fuel you, fuel your body and your brain. Um, or you could kind of, you know, eat anything and, and that would be more damaging to your body, especially because we now understand that inflammation is the basis of so many mental health conditions, including uh, cognitive problems. You know, Dr. Nadu, in the United States now, it's so hard to eat healthy. It really is. Like the yes. labeling has yes. gotten so tricky. And yes. I actually went completely the opposite way. I got so paranoid about the foods I was putting in my body because I didn't understand what was on the labeling that I went completely whole plant-based because I grab an apple and I don't need a label. That's all. That's right. There's no expiration date. It's an apple. So I got easy. I just did that. I couldn't do it anymore. I had to just like, yeah. that's just all I'm eating. I can tell you though, for me, it get, I get so much energy. I wake up full of energy. I have it all day. Um, when I used to eat, I would keep a log. And I would write down how I felt about 20 to 30 minutes afterwards. And it was like, I'm exhausted. I feel I feel like I'm bloated and mm -hmm. this food still feels like it's with me, you know, two hours later. And right. so I knew that that wasn't my food. <laughs> how do people well, recognize that when they're trying to maneuver the craziness in the United States and give their body and support it the way they should? I think that's a great question. I really appreciate what you shared because that's something I call, it's one of the pillars of nutritional psychiatry that I call body intelligence. So it's paying attention to what your body is making you feel and actually acknowledging it. You wrote it down, but understanding that so often someone will sit with me, um, you know, during an evaluation and describe symptoms and never connect it to the food. You know, Dr. Naidu, I'm, I have brain fog every afternoon. Um, you know, people on a hybrid model of working, I'm going to the uh, coffee shop and getting um, a cup of coffee and a cookie to keep me going. I'm going to the vending machine. They're not making that connection that the brain fog, that slump, that lack of energy, bloating, discomfort could actually come from how they've been eating. So that's important for us to pay attention to. What I'd like people to know is that, you know, when you eat a meal, pay attention to how it's making you feel. Um, you know, whole healthy foods don't have an expiration date. If you, it's, it's very difficult in the U.S. to avoid packaged foods, but limit that. You know, I'm, I'm not saying never ever eat a packaged food, but stay away from the frozen pizzas and the frozen dinners, um, you know, but, and look at packages so you understand what's, what ingredients are in, in the food. Um, and, you know, really lean into plants because um, plants, veggie foods, um, beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, healthy whole grains, all of these are rich in so many nutrients and fiber that our body needs, especially our gut. These are easy to do because you don't, you know, you mentioned an apple, um, you can get frozen vegetables if, if you prefer, because in the United States, frozen vegetables are frozen at their peak. So they, unless they have a sauce or sodium or syrup in them, they're actually pretty healthy for us. There are ways that we can build up on the vegetables in our diet as a base and then 
eat whatever else that you're eating. But that becomes important. And then understanding how those foods make you feel, logging it, typing it in your phone, whatever it is so that it brings it to awareness and then start to tweak what you're doing with that. You know, I wish that we could find a way to be more proactive instead of reacting because I didn't pay attention to what I was putting in my body until I, it broke down. Literally. Mm -hmm. I had, I ended up with gastroparesis. I had to have a radical gastrectomy and then my body started failing because I couldn't get nutrients into it. Mm -hmm. Having, and then I got smart, like, right. I, that makes you smart to survive <laughs> or to not be dying. And here's the thing. I noticed that I bet you most people come to you on the reactive side, never on a proactive side. Like, how do I stay feeling amazing? What do I do? Like, what's good yeah. for me? They don't do that. Yeah. They wait until they're like so sick. Like what's happening? Right. And they start then becoming reactive. I would love to see a generation of proactive people coming right. forward that are like, they get it because we've taught it to them. <laughs> me too. And you know, it's, it's the spirit of some of what I'm trying to do, but it, 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 it takes a while to almost um, engineer and bring forward that type of change. But it's absolutely true. You know, if we were paying attention, we tend to react, go to the doctor when we're sick, um, you know, treat high blood pressure, go because we have gained weight um, or family history of hypertension. Um, you know, we're not going in because we just, we just want to feel better. And especially with mental health, because it is still stigmatized and people are not going in and saying what, and also I mean, it's also twofold because doctors are not trained to talk about nutrition because we really don't learn enough nutrition in medical school. So when you're going to see a doctor, especially a psychiatrist, they're not going to ask you much about your diet. So this is a gap that I think we need to fill and we need to help educate our providers about. Uh, suddenly nutritional psychiatry is trying to bring that forward. Um, but if we, another condition that I think is very important for us to understand, you know, we, we think about cognitive disorders, Alzheimer's as a disease of the elderly, our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles. We don't actually think about ourselves in terms of cognitive health, but we should, every person, of any age should be thinking about their cognitive health because food reduces inflammation. If you're eating correctly, it reduces inflammation and neuroinflammation is associated as being one of the factors with cognitive disorders that we can reverse. You know, we don't have that cure for Alzheimer's yet, but we can actually eat to lower the inflammation, which does impact the change. So rather than thinking and, and reacting when someone is starting to lose their memory, losing their keys, being forgetful, why not we be talking about that now and changing the conversation, even for our cognitive health, so that, you know, we can fend off those conditions as well. I, I think, by the way, that it still fascinates me that in um, when you're in medical school, my daughters were in medical school when I was going through all of this. And when I went to them for help, they're like, Mom, we only got a semester of nutrition. And that was all based on how it interacts with drugs, right? It really wasn't how it supports right. the body. They are both now, right. they, they left regular medical school and they are both now um, DNM. So they're doctors of natural medicine with amazing PhDs behind that on nutrition. Yeah. And they understood yeah. the value, by the way, there's value. no shame in the game for doctors not getting more because you got to right. learn a lot. We've got to learn a ton of information yeah. and I think it's it's been omitted from the syllabus or, or really pared back. And some medical schools are trying. But the reality is doctors are in this position where we unfortunately expect to counsel people and we don't have enough of the information. Um, so I do think that that could change and should, should, you know, if we want to educate doctors better, then we should include nutrition because it's part of how the body works. And nutrition is such a powerful lifestyle factor for even conditions like type two diabetes now. Um, so it, it, it's critical that we, we try to evolve that system and that if, um, you know, that we understand where those gaps are. So I'm not a doctor and I would agree with you about the type two diabetes and um, also like things like eczema and psoriasis, your skin's right. an organ. And when you're eating toxic stuff, it's got to push out. When I was in school a billion years ago, we had like rarely had an overweight child in school. Rarely did you hear about anyone with diabetes type two and rarely did anyone have eczema or psoriasis. And now it seems like everyone I reach okay. out to they either have Has somebody, some they have condition. it, or someone in their yeah. family suffering from right. it. And I know it's or directly even allergies, related to our diet. You know, exactly, like allergies. Food allergies, intolerances, conditions. You know, people talk about conditions like autism being higher, 
um, related to, you know, the dietary factors in the mother, so many things like that. So, so we do, you know, we're still uncovering this area of science, but I think that one thing is true where we're eating meals probably a few times a day, and it's a basic need that we need to fulfill to run, to really fuel our bodies. Why not do it better? Because like you said, if you're eating a bad diet, it's going to reflect someone, eczema, you know, um, cystic acne so many things and people forget that the gut is involved and what does the gut do one of the many things it does is it breaks down our food so we we really can't omit that from the equation anymore so there are a few things i believe people can do to get control back of their own health and their journey one of the things that i learned when i would go to the doctors and uh, say i don't know i had i was borderline diabetic now they want to give you a medication and, and I get that they don't want you to miss a gap and it goes crazy and you have a diabetic episode. But now I always ask my doctor when they want to prescribe a medication, can I please see a nutritionist first? Can you give me three to six months? We'll redo my labs and see if I can get this under control on my own. They've never once told me no, ever. Well, that's great. They're that's like, great. yes, we can do that. If you want to Go the healthy right. route or the nutritional route. I'll recommend you or refer you out to a nutritionist. We'll work mm -hmm. up a plan on things you can incorporate in your diet and we'll keep an eye on it. The same way I got off all my medications. I would like to That's get off great. these. Can I see a nutritionist? I do blood mm -hmm. work regularly anyways, because I, I do Lovenox every day. And so um, I have to do weekly lab works. So I'm like, can we just once in a while throw that in there and see if Check those numbers yeah. are changing? And my doctor's weighing me off. Never wing yourself off a medication, by the way. Right, Always work right, with right. your doctor. I want to make sure I'm yes. very clear on that. I don't want everyone to eat apples and say, I don't have to take my pills anymore. But I worked with my doctor. We did right. lab work. She do just that. Me I, off. Right. I, I really like that you did that because you're asking the question. Your doctor's open to it. And you evolved to coming off certain medications safely. Um, you know, and you were including healthy foods as part of that journey, not one or the other, and not to the exclusion of anything. So I think that becomes important. It's that holistic approach. You know, the, the way that I work in psychiatry is a holistic, integrated, and functional approach. Because in the medical system, although doctors communicate, our specialties tend to be siloed. You know, so the gastroenterologist may not realize the patient showing up with anxiety that it could be actually related to their gut and their flares up of IBS or their new onset of symptoms. Same, same way with psychiatrists, they may not think that, um, you know, the gut issues that someone is experiencing may not just be a side effect of medication, it may be a bigger picture that they should be discussing with the gastroenterologist or bringing them into that conversation. So I think it's, it's, it's critical for us to, um, you know, advocate for ourselves and ask the questions. I, I you know, it, it would be, um, I would be disappointed if a doctor pushed back and said, oh, no, I, I, you have to take this medication. You know, I think that where someone is not critically ill, and it's not an emergency situation. That's the case. And I should also just drop in here, Jana, that, you know, nutritional psychiatry is meant to be a complement and to support any other forms of treatment the person is taking. It's not to the exclusion of psychiatric medications or therapy, both of which have saved the lives of many of my patients. And therapy is particularly helpful for individuals. But medications do not work for everyone. Um, but if you're acutely ill and you have severe symptoms, then you may need that initially. And you need to see a doctor urgently to get that taken care of. Dr. Nodu, for 100%, you are absolutely right. For instance, my doctor said yes to everything, but Lovenox, I have factor five Lydon, which is a blood clotting disorder, and I throw PEs all the time. And so I take Lovenox twice a day. And I ask, can I get off this? Absolutely not. We're not even going to try it. <laughs> like there is nothing that I can have because, you eat right. that will change that. That will change that. That's a great <laughs> example. In fact, I was going to I was going to say that, uh, and so I'm glad you did, because it's, it's not something that a person can safely come off and expect to survive, because we don't know if the next clot, you know, could be, could be difficult, so uh, could be dangerous. So, so you absolutely read there are those many patients. And the other thing is that remember that not every healthy food is healthy for everyone. 
right. for two reasons. One is that foods also have interactions. So a healthy grapefruit, people think, oh, you know, she's always saying, speak to your doctor. But it's important to do that for another reason. Grapefruit interacts with several medications because of liver enzyme interactions. So it's another fruit that while it's healthy for some, it may not be appropriate for everyone. And those are the things doctors are taught in terms of those interactions in pharmacology. So discussing it with your doctor is more more important than one realizes um but remember that food can always be a very helpful tool what no matter what your journey is i agree 100 percent. even for me i know that i'm a plant-based eater and so i also know that dark leafy greens are full of vitamin k and vitamin k right. thickens the blood which could right. cause me to start clotting I don't worry about it now because I take Lovenox, but before no, no, right. I used to have to like, I can't, I have to limit my dark greens and yeah. be, be aware of what's in my yeah. healthy foods, right? right. So right. now I don't have to do that. Thank you, Good Lovenox. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an eight year journey of injections, oh. but I haven't had a clot sense. So I'm super grateful that we have that ability. Right. And you have a medication that can, you know, that right. can spare you that illness. Yeah. So I am grateful for medications. I'm grateful for holistic, that holistic side of everything. And I think it works the best when we do it together and we do it supervised, right? We don't just go on a, a read something and go on a ramp and do it ourselves. Right. It, and I think that that's where the diet wars and, and, and uh, all these dilemmas come in. And the same things apply to medications. We, especially during COVID, we shouldn't be watching an ad on television or um, a show and, uh, you know, making a decision about a medication, you should still be talking to our health professionals. And I know sometimes appointments are not easy to get and stuff like that, but it's, it's worth it because it's your, your health is also needs to be maintained safely. I definitely want to talk a little bit about your book before the podcast finishes up. Um, this is your brain on food. I, um, first of all, I love the title <laughs> because it, it is your brain on food. Like what happens to us starts in our gut and our brain and they talk to each other and everything starts to happen. So I would love to know more about who that book is for, what they're going to find in it. Absolutely. So uh, I, 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 when I wrote the book, I used um, the DSM sort of diagnostic classification just to break it down to make it easier for people to understand. The reality is that everyone that has, has read it, that has written to me, has found it useful because it's really a companion to healthy eating. It's a compendium of information talking about different conditions and who hasn't felt a little blue at points, a little more anxious at times, has slept poorly, maybe it's because of the pandemic, uh, may have experienced trauma as a part of their life. So it doesn't mean that, you know, if you've not seen a doctor for psychiatric diagnosis, you can still read this and think about how you're eating, things that you can limit or avoid for certain conditions, but also things you can embrace and add into your diet of really healthy whole foods to feel emotionally better. So it's intended for everyone. It's broken down into different conditions. I walk you through the gut brain romance in the first chapter to explain the science behind how the gut and brain are connected. Um, then in every chapter, there's a, there's a cheat sheet at the end, which is foods to embrace and foods to limit or avoid. Chapter 11 is entirely recipes to get you started. Uh, and it pairs with each chapter. So you can mix and match as you like them. But you know, foods that will help with mood uh, in that recipe section and really heightening the ingredients that have been shown to help mood. Um, and that's how it's broken down. So I hope, I hope people will enjoy it. How can they find you and your book? I want everyone to know where they can go get this book, where they can learn more about the, the gut brain connection and how your brain works on food and the best foods for us. Thanks, Jenna. So my website is umanaidumd.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter. You get some free booklets when you subscribe. And after that, you can link to the book there. But you can also support your local independent bookseller um, or buy it online. And please follow me on social, uh, which is at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O. -O. I also, Jana, just released my first course, uh, a digital online um, virtual course in nutritional psychiatry for people who want to take a deeper dive than the book. So the book is sort of the backbone of it, working through that, but then taking a much, as you know, when you write a book, you 
you never have enough pages to put all your thoughts down. So this is really an extension of what I was able to include special topics, especially for women. Um, I always get questions about menopause. I get questions about um, children. I get uh, questions about, uh, you know, moms reaching out about how they kids should be eating healthy, about period pain, about migraines. So all of these extra topics we cover in the course. The first course just released a few weeks ago, but it's been so such a positive experience that I'm, I'm considering doing it again, uh, updating it and, and doing it later in the year. So you can check that out on my website. Dr. Naidu, I am so grateful for you to come on the show today because I really think that the work you're doing now, which this is like the key to my heart and soul, is that we are creating a generational change. Like we are going to create a change that will help our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids to be on a more proactive approach on their health and not wait till like me in their 50s when they're dying to like make changes to help keep you alive. Now I eat to not fill that hole, like an empty hole in my gut. I eat to th get my body thriving and moving and, and doing the things it needs to do. And it feels good. <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I love hearing that. And you're a great testament to this, actually. A, a great uh, way to share on that knowledge because you, you, you're living it and you can share that uh, through your own health journey. That's been so positive uh, as you went through it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Naidu. We're going to put all of Dr. Naidu's links to her book, to all of her social media, join her newsletter. Like seriously, when someone's giving you all that kind of beautiful information, take it, <laughs> take it. So go ahead and go and join all that. All the links will be in the social media notes here. And um, I hope that we have her back because she's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna, for having me. It was lovely to talk with you. Thanks for listening to the Oh My Health, There Is Hope podcast. Make sure to visit Jana's website, bestholisticlife.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or listen there so you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you simply tell a friend about the show, that'll help too. Let's change the world together, one health expert at a time. Looking forward to seeing you next time.